Okay, so in this episode, I'd like to talk about Bob Cousy. And I'd like to talk about kind of specifically basketball fans' perception of Bob Cousy in 2024. You know, is it accurate? What's a fair way of comparing him? And I'm going to pivot off of uh, some comments that were made by J.J. Redick and Gilbert Arenas. I'll sort of react to what I'm seeing here. I also put together some clips uh, of my own from Bob Cousy. So let's get right into it. Latest point guard, he's not Bob Cousy. He's not Bob Cousy. Bob Cousy couldn't dribble with his left hand. Celebrate Bob Cousy in his era, but you can't not- compare pre-1980 well, we never- with, 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 oh, yes, you can. with the modern yes, NBA. You can. No, you cannot. No, you, cannot. Well, how about- you can't compare that era like direct. The rules have changed. I don't, I don't know how much or how little JJ personally knows about basketball, like how it was played when Bob Cousy played. I, you know, I tend to think that JJ and then Gilbert, who we'll see, Gil, who we'll see here, I tend to think they might not know as much about how the game has changed as they do about like the modern game of basketball. Like they know a tremendous amount about the modern game of basketball. But uh, yeah, we'll see here. Oscar, can you compare Kuzi with Weston Oscar? The great players could play in any era. There's okay. no doubt about Kuzi that. Kuzi was they're, they're, first they're... team all in NBA when, Kuz, when Weston Oscar were playing. And he was first team all NBA. That's against Weston Oscar. Well, first team all NBA. You know, Has Paul ever been first team all did NBA? Did Bob Kuzi ever shoot over 40% from the field? Well, in his we career? understand that. Did You're he right. overshoot? Oh, did he no, ever shoot over not. 40%? Probably 39, 40%. Different kind not of game. Once. I, it's not fair. once. That's fair. He also had 29 assists in an NBA game. Oh, well, you know, he was being guarded and, and, by plumbers and firemen. Your first player, Bob Kuzi. From the 50s? Bob, but you got to you gotta play in the janky shoe, the janky. I don't even know if they had Chuck. Play his era. Can he play in my era? Okay. Well, I, get, I get my same talent? You have your same <laughs> Come on. Come on, bro. You Bob Cruz is not locking you up? No. Hey, man, he's spinning around his circles. Come on, man. These damn mailmans and, you know, how much <laughs> store clerks. I'm, so I'm so you got Bob Cruz guarding you. Like, and you, you show up, he's like, Bob Cruz is guarding you. Are you just cracking up? What? I'm laughing. I'm laughing. All right, so I I, I got to say, you know, I, Gil wouldn't be the kind of player he was if he didn't think he would match up favorably against just about anyone in best NBA history. So I'm not going to really fault him for that. In fact, I actually think he's kind of right on the money that he, you know, one-on-one. He's he, he's too big for Bob Cousy, and he's got, he's got a... Like, his game is more built around one-on-one. That's irrespective of eras here, but I will get into Gil probably under... He still probably underestimates Bob Cousy in that respect. And I don't know what he thinks about Bob Cousy in a five-on-five, but, you know, I'm going to try to showcase, like, hey, the five-on-five was Bob Cousy's bread and butter. Definitely not ISO basketball or one-on-one basketball, even though... Koozie probably could do that, but the skill level, the skill level at that time really wasn't developed. Okay. Okay. So it's just like you sitting here trying to do all this. I ain't yeah. never got to worry about a crossover. Stop. So basically, he's talking about that palms down dribble, and palms down was how you had to dribble back then. So let's 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 take a look. That's like that you expect to win the basketball game. Randy Smith took it away. He comes back down the other way, and they're going to call him on a dribbling violation. He on the ball. That NBA. So that would not get called at all today. That's basically how NBA players build their game today: is off of this ability to put your hands on the side of the ball and basically carry it or palm it by the rules of the past. This is 1970s basketball here. Uh, uh, I'll show another clip that's 1970s Lakers and 1970s ABA versus NBA. I don't have too many examples of palming or carrying from the 50s or 60s. Actually, I have none that I can think of uh, off the top of my head, but that's because everybody knew not to push the envelope for ball handling. Well, today, you know, today my hand will be under the ball because you couldn't, I mean, you carry the ball all over the place today, but... Just to turn the ball over. He has called for Collins. Gilmore, a 
ABA looking to run every time. Here is Ralph Simpson in the game now in backcourt. He pounded the ball first time he got it, and the NBA gets it back. It's right there. That would not get good. It's, it's not even close. Not even close. I see that all the time today. Now, by the way, you could do you could do a crossover back then. So these next clips, they'll show you you could do a crossover. So here, here's Oscar Robertson. But you just had to keep your you had to keep your hand on top of the ball. Here's Archie Clark doing it. Ooh, Archie Clark was good. Archie Clark was one of the first players that really on a regular basis weaponized the crossover. Oscar did it a little bit, you could see. Uh, Jerry West did it a little bit. Um, Archie Clark is not a superstar from that era. He was an all-star a few times, but Archie Clark is one of the first guys that really turned it into a weapon, that crossover. Uh, but again, he's got to keep his palms on top of the ball. The skill level, the skill level at that time really wasn't developed. Okay. Okay. So it's just like you sitting here trying to do all this. I yeah. never got to worry about a crossover. Stop. Yeah. I played that clip again because he, I think he's kind of referencing that he's seen clips of Bob Cousy doing that dribble. Bob Cousy did that as a defensive dribble, not an offensive dribble. And in the sense that he was stalling basically to close out games where his Celtics had the lead. Uh, and he, he became famous for that. You know, I, I think that might also be a misunderstanding by Gill that that's how Bob Cousy played one-on-one. -on -one. He did not play one-on-one -on -one like that. He just, he was playing keep away. So that's these that's clips like this right here where he just slaps it top of the ball because he's got to do palms down dribble and he's just doing this to show off basically again Bob Cousy's playing in handcuffs so he's just playing keep away here he's just draining the clock this is a famous clip usually played back in slow motion where he that guy trips and then he it's like he broke his ankles but <laughs> um, this is Bob Cousy doing it at his camp Again, you, you see Bob Cousy has to touch only the top of the ball. He At no point does he rake it across and, and go left to right and carry it like modern players do. This is because he's playing under the rules of that era. So he conditioned himself to be an exceptional ball handler like that, uh, like the Harlem Glo Globetrotters here. These were the best ball handlers on the planet, and that's how they dribbled. This is a 1950s clip uh, that I threw in here of a college player. Just to show you that just because Bob Cousy didn't weaponize his dribble and use it offensively, like how I mentioned Archie Clark kind of did, um, doesn't mean that Bob Cousy couldn't have. Uh, here's a here's a 1950s college player who is using uh, his handle to create space on offense, like sort of how we're used to modern players doing it. But again, he still has to do it with the palms down dribble. So if you look here, he sham gods, freezes the defender as a jumper again knocks the defender back yeah you could play that way back then that's not how Bob Cousy was though Bob Cousy was not an ISO player like this so so Gil's right Gil would beat him in one on one but not what Bob Cousy does so let's get into what Bob Cousy did do best which is open court basketball and Bob Cousy had a really gifted mind for open court basketball he also had excellent peripheral vision. If you look at if you look at pictures, like his eyes are like on the side of his head almost. It's kind of like Steve Nash was like that. And uh, Bob Cousy also had other you know basketball attributes. Even though he was only six one, uh, he had long arms, uh, big hands, long fingers, the whole nine yards that helped him uh, be an exceptional point guard physically. Even though today you might look at him and be like, well. He didn't lift weights. Nobody lifted weights back then, but a few players. So, you know, you can't really fault him for that. If he played today, obviously he would be under a much different, you know, physical regimen to be in shape for basketball. But uh, back then, cardio was kind of the emphasis. So he didn't do anything with his upper body. But he had long arms, excellent peripheral vision. He, he did have basketball talent, you know, even though he was only 6'1". So here we'll get into some Bob Cousy highlights of what he did best. Yeah, it's famous behind the back, which sets him up for shots and passes. Uh, behind the back bounce passes. 
go to baseball passes. Here you see him do a pull-up jump shot. Uh, one-handed push shot. Another jump shot off a spin. Here's that behind the back. Now he's doing it to uh, set players up for a offensive for, uh, set, set his teammates up for the assist. Very good at leading the players. It's a blind behind the back pass in the all-star game. By the way, for his size, seems like a decent finisher around the rim. We'll get into like his shot, field goal percentage later, but um, you know, seems to have good control and knows knows how to uh, hesitate in midair. He's behind the back. Ooh, touch pass! Nice touch pass. I gotta watch that one again. This is another all-star game. Nice floater over the big. Here you see him take it in the post. Nice. So that jump shot would set up that he could fake and do the pass on plays like that. Faking the layup. Another baseball pass. There's that behind the back again, this time setting up for a shot. So now this one shows that he does freeze and triple threat like he's going to shoot. Like this is kind of, this would kind of go into a shooting motion here. You see how he normally shoots. He normally does a one handed push shot. It's kind of unorthodox. You wouldn't see that today very often, um, except for players doing like desperation shots or off balance. Bob Cousy kind of did that on a regular basis, but uh, here you see he's trying to see if his defender comes up on him. Then he just goes inside, dishes it to Bill Russell. So I did want to talk about field goal percentage here. JJ Redick mentioned that Bob Cousy never shot over 40% for his career, and He's right about that. So Bob Cousy shot 37.5% from the field for his career. You have to understand that the league average during this time was 39%. So Bob Cousy is only one and a half percentage points below league average. Uh, by comparison, JJ Redick is about 1% below league average through his playing career. Russell Westbrook is about 1.9%. Uh, percentage points below league average throughout his career. So Bob Cousy is somewhere between a Westbrook and a Redick with a uh, field goal percentage, uh, both of whom were effective, very effective guards in the modern game. And Bob Cousy's kind of like sandwiched in between them on efficiency. You can't take anything away from the impact these players made only being one or two percentage points off from league average as guards. Bob Cousy is one and a half percentage points off from league average as a guard. That means when he's setting up outside, he's a threat to shoot from outside. And that means when he comes in for layups, he's a threat to make those layups uh, at a reasonable rate. The conditions that the players had to play in, in the field, it's, it's very different than today's game. There's no no charge circle in the paint. is smaller in Bob Cousy's career. The lane is only 12 feet. Traveling violations. Pablicek guarding Selby who gets off the shot for his ball for traveling. A lot of you guys are doing like this. 
It's facing him and then you step. That's a trial. And, and unfortunately, it happened about the day also in starting up the Boston offense. Traveling is the call. You do this, this is the trap. Yeah. So if you get the ball away, or even though you get it, quick first step and then the ball on the dribble. What about, what about crossover steps? Let's say you're facing up again. Okay. And you jab and go left. And the drop like No. So anything where your foot leaves yeah. before the ball comes down. Yeah, I mean, you cannot move the pivot foot no matter what, before you dribble. So if I want to go right, put the goddamn ball down. Yeah. Or exactly. you're going to be like really low and push the flight. You have to sell it to the referee. Like you cannot be just going this way. Ramsey, call for traveling. <laughs> Bombing violations, carrying violations, all of these things were way more strict. Offensive players were handcuffed in Bob Cousy's era. The defensive players often got rewarded. Oh, and offensive foul calls were way, way easier to draw back then. Uh, you you basically did not have to have your feet set or give your offensive player uh, room to run. Shot at 16-11. Sam Jones going down the middle, offensive foul. Frank Selby is guarding Havlicek. That's Ramsey going in. Another offensive foul charged to Ramsey. Jones. Heinsohn going in. An offensive foul charged to Heinsohn. As he ran to LaRusso going in from the left side. So guarded by Wiley. Feeds out to Heinsohn. LaRusso guarding him. And Tommy Heinsohn again is charged with offensive Tommy Heinsohn. And Ramsey's getting set to go back in. Boston picking up across. With rules like this, everybody's field goal percentage was down. Almost everybody's. Like th that's why the whole league average. I should I should mention the whole league average here. The league average field goal percentage in Bob Cousy's time was 39%. As I had mentioned, today for the past three decades, it's about 45.7. So with all the offensive freedom players have and the way defensive players don't have as many tools in their toolbox nowadays, uh, yeah, a couple of percentage points higher in average field goal percentage is like, I would think that's to be expected, you know? So that's something that people should keep in mind when they're talking about Bob Cousy. Uh, or trying to figure out how to evaluate him as a player. You can't really punish him for shooting 40%, less than 40% from the field when he's 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 only one and a half percent different than league average. Like that's how you that's how you have to look at him in that context. Kyrie Irving was transported and teleported into a 1960s finals game right. seven. Well, have to they would look at him like he was a wizard. You have to judge players in their time. You can't take a player 60 years from now and throw them back. But the context of playing against. Here is a foul against Archie Park as Don Freeman had position on him and Park has called for an offensive foul. And we'll look at it again here. That's a stutter step. Then he darted to. So look at this. Archie's basically in midair. And both feet are not in place by the defensive player. In fact, Archie's left foot lands on the left foot of the defensive player as it's still sliding. And it's a charge on Archie Clark. You have to they would look at him like he was a wizard. It was a terrible call. I'm not going to give you that opportunity. You know I'm saying the, 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 refs, the refs said if he could dribble like that, he'd play in the league. The last thing I'd like to talk about is uh, Bob Cousy's left hand. Does he always dribble with his left hand going left? No, but he never loses control of the ball. And again, with all the rules and all things considered in his era, they don't even, he doesn't even set up the same way that a lot of players would play today. 
you know, he's not a guy who did not work on his left hand. He's got some tremendous finishing ability with his left hand, uh, which we'll see here. Left hand runner. Behind the back, left hand pass, another runner. It's a separate one. Behind the back pass, left handed. The left handed off balance shot under the basket. Another off balance in, in midair. This one he's wrapped up, left handed, throws it up. This is just a simple pivot. It, he could do a lot of hook shots with his left hand on the run in the post. That's a little floater. Another left hand finish following his shot. This is just showing you know, him doing the mic and drill, which is how he dialed in that left-handed hook. And a left-handed free throw. Uh, that that actually came after he made like nine consecutive right-handed free throws. He he threw in one with the left hand. I think that's kind of like a in film lore that he during the whole take he never missed uh, while they were talking. So you know, I don't know if that's true or not. It, it seems like it might be true because he's in he's a former NBA player. He was a pro. Am I going to change a lot of people's minds about Bob Cousy? You know, eh, probably not. People are going to have their minds made up on players like him. But I'm hoping, you know, there's a lot of you that like weren't sure about like how to analyze his game or, or, or what to look for. You know, why did he play that way is one of the most important contexts I think that you can have for understanding how Bob Cousy played or most any of the players from that era. By, by today's standards, all those players are very handcuffed with what they can do, especially with dribbling. And well, not just especially with dribbling, dribbling, driving, post-ups, all of it. They, the game back then was very much catered towards favoring defense. It was just one-on-one -on -one defense back then, but they gave the one-on-one -on -one players a lot they gave the one-on-one -on -one defenders a lot in their toolkit, and the offensive players had a lot less in their toolkit back then. So I think that's important to understand. Uh, let me know what you think about this video. Let me know what you think about Bob Cousy. You know, I, I'm planning on doing a lot more videos like this. I have like, you know, I've got like 30 ideas right off the bat. Uh, I'm trying a new format here to see if I can get more videos out more often. This is a little less intensive with the editing and a little bit more of my own thoughts and opinions in the mix. And if you guys like it, you know, I've got plenty more video ideas like this. Uh, it could be about a wide variety of players or topics. I'm also open to your guys' feedback. So, you know, if you've got some ideas uh, uh, of what I could review, you know, drop them in the comments. Looking for the breaking man. There it is, Miss Sanders, deflected by Johnny Kerr. The many, many rebounds. Cousy flying. Cousy. Behind the back again. The crowd wooing and hawing. Right now, Dan Jones, that little cat of 12 foot. You won't miss too many of those. Great. Years ago, it was always a foul. the changes in basketball from the time you were one of the best to play the game to the, the period that you were coach and finally to being an NBA analyst? I guess it was more simple when we played and, uh, and I think frankly I was going to say the coaches have complicated it. I'm, I'm not sure that's probably an easy answer but uh, maybe it's a reflection of some of their insecurities because the game has become much more structured and much more disciplined. The transitional part of the game, which I grew up with, we fe featured on those great Celtic teams, uh, even in college. At every level, uh, most of the offenses uh, that were being played were transitional in nature. If you had to go 
uh, controlled in terms of half-court sets and calling plays or systems. You did that if the fast break or the transition part of the game didn't work. Uh, now that's completely reversed, uh, even on a professional level. Uh, everything is kind of by design, and in my humble judgment, the game is a game of free flow. The option to the play, for instance, works better than the play itself in basketball. Uh, the defense tells you, the offensive player or the point guard, what to do, what to create, what to develop, etc. So uh, we don't see this as much anymore. There are 29 teams in the NBA. Perhaps four of them are focusing on some degree of the transitional game. Most of them, the coaches like to jump up and hold up fingers every time down. Well, obviously, if you have to stop and see what the coach wants you to do offensively, forget the transition game. You know, it's not going to happen. Uh, obviously, as an old-timer, I would make a strong argument in any forum that the transitional part of the game should be in every coach's arsenal um, at any level. If I were arguing my case in court, I'd say mm -hmm. I'd put my creative instincts uh, against anybody who's ever played the game, frankly. And how I saw the floor, and then all we did was run. We didn't have any freaking plays. We had six plays, and if we never called them, Al Back was a happy camper. That meant we blew their doors off with the transition game. And that's what, and, but each time down, in transition, the, the, the scenario changes and you, the point guard, have to adjust and do obviously what's best to achieve your goal. Put the ball in the hole, give it to someone, make scores out of the other four people, all that. And so I, I would not take a back seat. I think that obviously was my strength. The successful teams are all team oriented, Dan, because the game can't be played without five guys. Well, actually, it's Again, in my judgment, it's a seven or an eight-man game. Uh, so you have to integrate five or eight people together and, and uh, doing it in a, in a cohesive, unselfish manner in order to reach the top of whatever level you're at. Uh, the NBA or professional sports is also showbiz, so now that they've developed the high-profile players in basketball, especially that are known literally all over the world, you know, obviously this is what we hear about, what what the ESPNs and the, you know, the sports channels of the world feature because they know that you, the fan, if you're going to pay 80 bucks to see uh, grown men play a child's game, you want to relate to, and it's easier to relate to the Larry Bird or the Michael Jordans or whoever the, 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 the high profile guy at the moment is than it is to, uh, to perhaps selling a team. But the bottom line is the, uh, the teams that are successful. And also in a final analysis, I think what draws you the fan is the, the competitiveness of the two teams that you are going to see. Obviously Celtics, Lakers, uh, uh, Celtics, Philadelphia, you know, the rivalries change, but I think you've got to sell both. You've got to sell the individuals and the team but the game uh, is not successful, uh, successfully executed, played by, by, as I say, six or seven or eight people.